Welcome to worship and welcome to Shiloh. I want to give a special thank you to our amazing Emily Seitz for, you might not be able to see her, maybe the top of her head, um, <laughs> for leading worship for the last two weeks when I had some prior commitments. So thank you. She did an amazing job, didn't she? Amen. 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 Yes, you can clap her if you want. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So we're going to get started with worship. I'm so excited to worship with you guys. Um, we're going to sing about how amazing our Lord is, so I hope you're excited.
champion? Do you believe that he's your champion? Sing it out. You are my champion. Giants fall when you stand undefeated. This next song we're going to sing is called Jesus at the Center. It's new. Uh, well, technically it's not new, <laughs> but it might, it might be new to everyone. It's new to me. And as we're going to learn about and talk about, Dan's going to talk about the body of Christ, and um, he's going to talk about the many parts. And so when we sing this song, it's talking about Jesus being the center of it. We all have our specific important roles, but Jesus has to be the center of it. He has to be the reason. He has to be our everything. There's a part in there that says, Jesus be the center of your church. And I love how it says, not Jesus be the center of my church, but your church. Because when we come here, when we give our tithes, when we're serving, it's not that we're giving something of us. It was all his to begin with. So we're giving just everything back to him because he deserves it all. He deserves this church. It's not even ours. Again, it's all his. He deserves our hearts. That's all his. He deserves our lives. It's all his. So as we sing this, would this be your prayer that Jesus, would you be the center of this church? Would you be the center of our hearts? Would this be the center of everything that we do? Everything of 
revolves around you Jesus you From our heart to the heavens Jesus be the center It's all about you Yes, it's all about you Jesus, this is our prayer that you would be the center, the center of this church, the center of our hearts, the center of our lives, the center of our thoughts, the center of our actions. God, please forgive us when this hasn't been the case. God, we are all sinful and we need you. God, may this be the prayer of our hearts every day that everything we do points to you. And the reason why we do it is all for you because of your love for us, God. May that be the reason. May you be the center of everything. God, we thank you for what you've done for us. We thank you for sacrificing your one and only son so that we could have this freedom in you that our sins could be wiped clean because of you, God. You deserve our lives. You deserve for you to be the center of our lives. God, forgive us. Forgive us when we need to be more for you. God, would you open up our eyes today and our hearts and our ears to listen to what your Holy Spirit is gonna speak through Pastor Dan. God, would we be open to it? God, would you help us to leave here changed that we wouldn't desire to be complacent, but we would be, we would desire to be in you, but that we would desire for you again to be the center of everything, God, because we know that when you are a part of our lives, when you ignite our heart, things change. 
Our whole lives change because you ignite everything. God, help us to be stronger in our faith. No matter what situation we're going through, help us to lean on you, God. We thank you so much for your blessings. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. That's where we will begin. 1 Corinthians, we're going to read from chapter 12, starting at verse 12. In your table Bibles, those maroon colored Bibles, you will see that on page 1139, 1139. Now, while you find that, I want to add a prayer request to you, uh, to your life. Um, please remember Susan Hobbig and her family. Susan is uh, near the end of her battle with cancer right now, so just pray for her and uh, her family. Now, we're going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting at verse 12. As we get ready to read that, I, I have to say that, you know, last week, we talked about a scripture passage that was enriched by some interpretation and so sometimes scholarship and Bible study can make more life for us in scripture but thanks be to God there are plenty of times when we read scripture it speaks plainly for itself and it doesn't require any assistance from the likes of me this would be one of those passages so I invite you to read with me as I read out loud and See if you don't get exactly what Paul means for you to understand. The Apostle Paul in his first letter to the church at Corinth, starting at verse 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of the one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if an ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is... God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts and yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need for you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need for you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, and third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating in various kinds of tongues. All Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the higher gifts. And I will show you a still more excellent way. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So here we have the Apostle Paul laying something out for us that's pretty plain and pretty easy to understand. Wouldn't you agree? He's basically saying that we are all one body in Christ. We are the body of Christ. And that there is no part of the body that's less significant than another. Well, listen, I can tell you from very personal experience that you've kind of witnessed whether you were aware of it or not. 
I had surgery on my hand, primarily my thumb, on the Wednesday before Christmas, and I've been walking around with the cast and then eventually with the brace, and now I'm free of it. And i got to tell you something. I'm right-handed, and I never really thought that much of my left thumb. I didn't really think I'd need it that much, and I probably wouldn't miss it. And all I want to do right now is say, thumb, I'm sorry. <laughs> I took you for granted. Because, boy, you need your unused thumb a lot more than you realize. And once you have it disabled for a while, it becomes apparent, you know. And, and in the way that Paul says that if one part of the body hurts, the whole body hurts, let me tell you something. If you've ever stubbed your toe, you understand what that means. So we understand then that the body of Christ is a complete unit just like we are. And that's exactly what Paul wants us to understand. This is transcendent because it doesn't matter how much you know about the neurological system or the physiology as we have so comprehensively understood it in our day. Paul understands with his 2,000-year-old knowledge of the human body everything he needs to understand and everything we need to understand. And this is what we are meant to take away from this. The body of Christ is all of us. It's all of our parts. Each of us is the body of Christ. Christ intended it this way. When he breathed the Holy Spirit on the apostles and then released the Holy Spirit to all of us who would be born again through our repentance and our acceptance of God's grace, we are the body of Christ. Now, many religions will talk about their founders in the past tense because they're gone, like Muhammad or Buddha or Confucius or many other important characters in this grand scheme of things, and yet they're all gone. And we say to people that our Christ is alive, and they say, that's, I, you know, sure, but show me, where's Christ? I don't see Jesus. Where's Jesus? Where can I go visit Jesus? And then you say, well, you know, come to church. And so they assume then maybe that he's there invisibly behind the altar or something. See, we've created a whole religious order since these words were written that has made it a little confusing. And so let's talk about that for a minute. Now, we're doing something that is not traditional down here in our life center by worshiping with a stage and without a lot of religious paraphernalia, and so it doesn't feel traditional. But we're doing something very traditional right now. I'm here behind an invisible wall talking to you, and you sit silently on that side of the wall. That's church tradition right there. That's the assumption that I am Shiloh Church. That is the operating premise of most churches, that the pastor and the staff are the church, and we attend there. We worship there. We receive benefits there. We have membership there. Well, Jessica's got a membership at a fitness club, and I can tell that it's making a big difference in her life, but she doesn't own it. She isn't the fitness club. She's an example of what regular fitness will do to make you a strong and healthy and viable person, but see, we can't be members of this church and necessarily be members of the body of Christ. Yet that's exactly what Jesus intended. When he released the Holy Spirit and he ascended into heaven, his objective was plain. It doesn't require a scholarship to figure this out. He intended then that we would be Christ. That together we are Christ. And we're more, exam we're, we're more of an example of Christ together than we are as individuals. You see, God began with the idea of community because God was community. Because God in the person of the Trinity is a community. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is a community. There's an entire divine realm that existed before humanity that is a community. And from that community, we have the angels and the hierarchy of the angels. And we also have the dissenting angels who become the source of so much evil and deception in our world, too. All of this is scriptural, and it is a picture of community. And so God has always intended it to be community. When God created Eden and then created humanity to exist in community, he made a woman. This is not necessarily a picture of the husband and wife as much as it is a picture of community, of family, of unity under God, that this body of people would be the representation of Christ. We are made in the image of God, and Jesus is that image. 
So we are made like Jesus. And yet sin has separated us from our creator, but not from each other. We did not see one cast out of Eden. We saw all of them cast out. Whether we're talking about Adam and Eve and that traditional picture of a man and a woman and in their birthday suits and, you know, all that. It, it, in the end, what we're seeing is this, this people that God created for community or communion with himself through Jesus cast out of God's presence entirely. And so now they are the body of people made in the image of God outside of the immediate presence of God. That's the story of Eden. Now Paul is saying because of Christ we are one with God the Father again through the redemption that was purchased through Christ. Therefore we are the body of Christ. We are Eden wherever we gather in his spirit. We are Christ wherever we gather in his spirit. That's a big, big concept. And therefore, why does the church exist? It exists for the very purpose of being the body of Christ. Now, what we've done in our historical journey is create institutional church, which I'm not going to rail against. I'm just trying in my heart to figure out how we can be both an institution and an organization called Shiloh Church and still be the body of Christ. Like, how can we be both? I think we can. I think we can facilitate through this, this resource that God has given us called a building and an institution and an organization. I think we can make all of this serve God's intention of making us the body of Christ. I don't think we have any choice, to be quite honest with you, because this is what we got, you know? How many of you have learned in the last couple of years the, the beautiful art of adaptation and acceptance? That, one, one guy right back there. That, you learn to accept and adapt because you don't have any choice. <laughs> and there's been a lot of that going on since the pandemic messed everything up. The sooner we can accept what we cannot change, the more quickly we can adapt. And so here we are, the body of Christ, amid a historically flawed system called church with a small c. And Paul's solution is really simple. Be the body of Christ. Be a thumb, be a toe, be a knee, be an ear, an eye. And if you, like me, are called to it, Maybe be a voice, because sometimes that's what it's called to. But there's something I wish I could change right now. And honestly, it's a little easier in this part of our building. I wish I could take away this invisible wall that separates us. Because some of you people know me better than others. Some of you spent several hours with me yesterday in a leadership workshop, and you know that I'm incredibly human and incredibly flawed. And just a regular guy who happens to be called to be, on one hand, general manager of a religious institution, and on another hand, called to a divine preaching and care and shepherding ministry. But it most of the time just looks like I'm a guy running a religious organization. Now, the reason I say that is because that means that I am not the body of Christ. I'm far too inefficient and too ineffective as a body of Christ in one person, as it should be. But together we are the body of Christ. Together we are a complete package. This is why I talk so much of being born again in the Holy Spirit. It is this one unifying source of God energy that makes us one body. Paul might have said it this way in an addendum to what he told the church in Corinth. He might have said, you are all equal parts of the body, but there's this one divine spark that runs the electrical system, the neurological wiring, you might say, right? And that is the thing that gives the body life, and it is the Holy Spirit. Paul might say, the air you breathe, which, by the way, empuseo is a historical word for Jesus breathing the Holy Spirit on you. He might say that the air you breathe that brings 
oxygen into your lungs and then causes the oxygenation of your blood and causes the circulatory system to work efficiently. He might say that all of that is the work of the Spirit in the body of Christ. Each of us is a part that serves a vital purpose, some more secret and more uh, uh, quiet and reserved than others, but all equal parts, all infused with the voice and the spirit of God, like the air we breathe, all enlivened by the spark of divine energy that is the Holy Spirit. Therefore, when somebody says, show me Jesus, the thing you must do is bring them to the body of Christ. You should bring them to the people of God. And the, it's not necessarily silo with a new logo or an old logo. It's, it's not this building. The church is not this building. The body of Christ is not these grounds. The body of Christ is not Pastor Dan and the staff. The body of Christ is not the uh, registered entity known as Shiloh Church. The body of Christ is you and me together being Christ in our community. In him we live and move and have our being. That's what Paul wants us to understand. Now I want to take it a little further. The church at Corinth was a troubled church, and we can thank God for that. Yeah, you heard me. We need to be grateful that there was a messed up church in Corinth that had it so bad that Paul had to write to them to straighten them out because, thank goodness, we have some instruction from the apostle writing in the spirit about what to do when your church is messed up. Some of you have been here a long time. I'm looking out, and I know you, and I know you've been around here for many, many years. Would you say this church has been messed up sometimes? <laughs> Some of you are giggling, and I mean, I can hear me, but I can see you. It doesn't matter whether I was here when it was messed up. I was somewhere doing, doing church when it was messed up. As a pastor, I've witnessed church messes everywhere I've gone. And you know what causes the messes? Now, first and foremost, it's the enemy. It's Satan. He thrives on chaos. He loves oppression. Therefore, wherever some members of the body oppress other members of the body, it brings chaos. Wherever emotions reign higher and rank higher than feeling or than facts, we have chaos. And what happens in the body of Christ is, is that it falls apart. An arm falls off, a thumb malfunctions, a eye no longer sees clearly, a voice is broken, a mind is confused, and the body is broken. Now, when my thumb started to malfunction, I talked to my favorite mechanic, also known as a surgeon, and he told me what we could do to fix it. We fixed it, but it's still going to take a while for it to get back to healthy state of being. But the beautiful thing is, is it could be fixed. And so it is with the body of Christ. When we have malfunctions in the body of Christ, there are things we can do to fix it. There are things we can do to recover the family, the body of Christ, and be a whole entity again. And I want to talk about that now. The Apostle Paul tells us elsewhere that wherever there's discord in the body, it's important that we, with humility examine the circumstances and the situation. My notes contain a number of scripture references you might find helpful. If you have the church app, the sermon notes are there. If you would like, a paper copy is out there. And if we run out of papers, I can always send you more in the way of emails or print out more for you. But here's what I want you to know generally from the Apostle Paul across his letters is he wants people to understand that where there is brokenness in the body of Christ, the first thing we have to do is humbly examine the situation with wisdom from on high and love as our guiding purpose. The number one goal of solving conflict in the body of Christ is unity, to bring the whole body back into one accord with itself. 
You know, there are people with neurological problems that cause parts of their body not to do what they want them to do. And so consequently, they have a strange way to walk or they have a limited ability in some form or another that prevents them. My daughter Ruthie uses a wheelchair to get herself around because part of her body isn't getting the signal and it's malfunctioning. But in the body of Christ, there are remedies for that. In the body of Christ, we can correct some of these problems. Some problems are brought on because people within the body of Christ have a lack of maturity and development in their spiritual journey, and yet they ascend to places of authority and, uh, and perception of, of you know, superiority that leads them into trouble. There's a scripture passage in the Acts of the Apostles about a certain couple named Ananias and Sapphira. Ananias and Sapphira were early Christians who really got excited about this new movement and they really sold themselves out to the, to the cause and, and they gave everything they had, or so they said, to the cause. But they were actually keeping some of it back and lying to the body about what they kept back. Now that in and itself would be, you know, because here's how it turned out and then you'll understand where I was going with this. So what happens is, is they get confronted about it by the leaders of the church and then the Holy Spirit pretty much pulls the plug on Ananias and Sapphira and they die instantly, right? And so that story by itself is a little frightening because it's like, okay, so you're saying if I lie to the body of Christ, I'm going to get zapped, right? Well, you have to look at the whole picture and you have to look at other scripture references to kind of, this is why it was so important for me to have you read your entire Bible as you many did. And I continue to advocate for reading the Bible. The more you know about what the scriptures say, the more you understand about the personality and nature of God. And you begin to realize that God's gripe with Ananias and Sapphira wasn't so much their one crime of lying to the body of Christ. It was that they were living a lie in the name of Jesus. They were presenting themselves in a way that served them more than it served Christ, and yet they were saying all the same things that the sold out, utterly, completely devoted believers said. And so in this early and dangerous time in the beginnings of the church, God had to set some things straight early so that people understood that there's no place for fake Christianity in the body of Christ. A body cannot tolerate infection and disease. Have you ever had a splinter that made your whole body hurt? And you think, how in the world could a tiny little sliver of wood or metal or something cause so much pain? And you know, sometimes those little splinters can turn into infections that actually kill the body. Isn't that amazing? Sometimes the Spirit of God says this is a big issue and the body of Christ is in danger. And so God acts in a severe way. Cool thing about a splinter is, is if you can brave a little bit of pain and you have a trustworthy friend with a steady hand and a good eyesight, you can probably get that splinter out and feel 100% better in no time. But it requires love, trust, steady vision and Steady hands, it requires patience, perseverance, a little bit of pain. The body of Christ is the same way. Sometimes we have to deal with discord in the body by recognizing the source of the pain and the disease and then extracting it as carefully and methodically as we can. Nobody likes hearing stuff like this. But many of you have long enough memories to know that when you do not deal with things in the church, when you fear confrontation so much that you refuse to deal with any form of it, you end up with a real bad sickness or disease in the body. And who suffers the most? Well, the glory of God is suffering when the body suffers and the haters, the enemy, stand off at a distance and cackle with delight. Look at all these megachurch pastors that are falling left and right these days. You know who wins when that happens? The enemy. You know who suffers the most? Those who need Christ and can't believe we know anything about him because we look like anything but the body of Christ. And so the body of Christ is made up of parts that work best when they are disciplined. Going back to the analogy of Jessica and, and, and her 
fitness goals. I hope she forgives me for this. You know, I have a coffee mug someone gave me for Christmas that says, be careful, you could end up in my sermon, you know, so sorry, Jess. I use her as an example because she's something I wish I could be, fit. (laughs) So anyway, I want to get back to my point before I lose it. When the body is disciplined, it serves its whole self well. When you know that you can count on your hand to do what your mind conceives of, good things can come of that. And you can create and make and serve and give and generate life. When you can't count on your hand to do what you want it to do, then there's risk and danger. And so it is with the body of Christ. That's why we call ourselves disciples, which is a word that means people living under a discipline. Discipleship and discipline, basically the same word. When there's discord in the life of the church, scripture tells us that the first thing we need to do is love unconditionally all parties and that we would do so for the sake of unity and there would be no desire for winning or punishing. More often than not, when there's discord in the life of the church, somebody wants to be right and somebody wants to make sure that their enemy has been labeled clearly as wrong. Our denomination is hopelessly divided this way right now. And in a few months, there will probably be more for us to talk about in that regard. But right now, there are people on one side of a particular ideology and people on another side of an ideology all claiming to be Christians like Ananias and Sapphira. But what they seem more determined to do is destroy the one they disagree with and make sure that in the end they have emerged as victorious and their enemy has been smashed into the dust in the name of Jesus Christ. Anybody else want to agree that this is sad, sick, and wrong? The body of Christ needs to be united under the discipline of Jesus Christ and we must seek to do no harm. We must seek to love one another and in the spirit of love we must do things that are painful and difficult that might cause harm to the body if they're not taken care of. But in the same spirit of love we must listen to each other and counsel each other with the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. I shared several hours with our leadership team yesterday, and I gave them a quote that I had just learned recently. It's not new, but it was new to me, and I love it. Here's the quote. You might want to write this down. Speak as if you are certain that you are right. Listen as if you are certain you are wrong. Speak as if you are certain you are right. Listen as if you are certain you are wrong. And this is how we in love and truth deal with brokenness in the body of Christ. Too often people act on assumptions and act on their emotional response to those assumptions and therefore do harm often to the person that their assumption is directed toward. And what's more, they discredit themselves and their discipleship by being absolutely averse to being told that their assumptions might be wrong. If you assume you need to be willing to have your assumptions challenged, And most people don't. Now I'm going to make it personal and then wrap this up. As a pastor in the last 25 years, and please remember what I said, as a pastor, I am in my own mind a Christian on a journey that happens to involve being the manager of this church business and a shepherd of this church flock. But I'm still just a guy on a spiritual journey of his own that happens to be highly public and visible in front of lots of other people. And here's what I've learned in the last 25 years, painfully. Some people assume things about me and talk amongst themselves, especially with other people who would like that assumption to be true. And they never, ever seek me out to ask me if what they assume is true. 
I find that really interesting because more often than not, I will find out through a third person removed that there's talk going around about me and the decisions I make or the things I say and how it has affected people. And then I'm sort of expected to fix it because I've been misunderstood. Well, I have always operated under the premise that if I'm misunderstood and public speaking is a big part of my job, I need to make myself more readily understood. So I take responsibility most of the time for being misunderstood. But then I found sometimes people just hear what they want to hear. And they act on what they assume and it causes me pain. And it causes discord in the body of Christ. And it disrupts the purpose that God has for us all. Please don't think that I'm using this platform to defend myself. I'm trying to use my own experience as an example. Because I know you've all been victimized by other people's assumptions too. You know, I was the third of three sons who went through high school a few years apart. And by the time I got to certain teachers in my high school, they already assumed that I was as big a pain in the neck as my two older brothers. I didn't have a chance. I remember a certain teacher who was an Air Force sergeant named Chief Rigotti. Chief Rigotti grabbed me by the collar one day, pulled me, you could do that back in those days, teachers, and pulled me into a corner and said, I put up a lot of mm -mm from your brothers and I ain't putting it up with it from you and I'm, I'm just scared out of my wits and don't know what I did wrong. This is what happens when assumptions direct actions. The Bible cure for assumptions is talk with other believers to the person about whom you've made these conclusions and see if what you think is true is in fact true. You do this not just for the sake of the person against whom you have a gripe. You do this for Christ's sake. You do this because when Christ's people fall and stumble and fight, when churches like this one become a laughing stock in the community, it is Christ who suffers most. And those who would be saved by him but reject him because Christians are such a poor example. And they think that maybe these days they'd be better off learning about transcendental meditation or going to some lengths to learn about other religious traditions where people seem to get along better. Our hypocrisy wounds Christ's reputation among the unsaved. And this is the most important reason for getting the body under control for his sake. The last thing to say is this. Sometimes in the life of the church, we have to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Jesus said, as you recall, when he was asked whether people should pay taxes he said, well, let me see one of those coins that you used to pay your taxes. And then he saw on there the graven image of Caesar. And he said, you know, you give Caesar what belongs to Caesar and you give God what belongs to God. Unfortunately, our institution is allowed to function within the laws and the standards of this land. And therefore, there are going to be times when we are, through no fault of our own, forced to deal with certain things in the life of the church because we have to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. And I would just hope that you give your spiritual leaders, your church community leaders, the benefit of the doubt and love them and give them grace. Because in the life of the church, this body stays healthy as long as we all work at it together. And we all recognize that any one part of this body is a representation of the body of Christ, Christ Jesus himself to the world out there looking for a reason to believe in Jesus or looking for a reason to despise Jesus. It's a hard one, and I hope that it will settle in your spirit over the next several days, and the Lord will heal you and help you through this as he does with me every day. Let us pray. Almighty God, I thank you for your word. I pray you burn it upon the hearts of your people and let them leave transformed, 
and in a process of transformation that is the discipline of your Holy Spirit under your, Christ, your King, our Christ Jesus. Lord, we do all this because we want you to be glorified and unashamed. Amen. Now, in response to God's word, I invite you to worship with song with Jessica and as the ushers serve you with God's tithes and your offerings. We're going to sing Jesus at the center again. I know that's not what's on the list, but I think that's relevant. Jesus at the center of it all Jesus at the center of it all From beginning to the end It will always be, it's always been you, Jesus Jesus, nothing else matters Nothing You're the center Everything revolves around you Jesus, you Jesus, be the center of your church Jesus, be the center of your church Jesus, be the center of your church I'll confess you, Jesus. Jesus, nothing else matters. Nothing in this world will do. Jesus, you're the center. stand as you are able, I'd like to ask God's blessing on you and send you forth. Sometimes there feels like more to say and sometimes it doesn't feel like anything else to say. This would be one of those times. So God bless you. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.